we're into our third big section through the book of Revelation from chapter 6 verse 1 all the way through to chapter 8 verse 5. Last week in chapter 5 we heard the question, who is worthy to take the scroll from the hand of God and open its seals? And we saw the Lamb as the only one who is worthy to do that. Now the scroll is going to be opened and we will see the whole unfolding of human history. But before we dig in together, I encourage you, as always, to read through the passage a few times and notice a few repetitions, key ideas that jump out. Spend some time praying and asking God to help you to understand His Word. That, as we saw in the letters to the churches, that you would have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to you. And then as you teach this to others, may that then come through clearly as you as you seek to help others to understand this text. Well, as always, I'm going to highlight things that have stood out for me. And the key character in this section continues to be the Lamb. The Lamb is the one opening these seals. Now I'm going to say this up front, we see these first uh, four seals being opened and it is the Lamb himself who is opening them. We see in the summary statement here that these horses, which we'll look at in a moment, were given power. It is the Lamb who gave them this power to kill by sword, famine, plague, wild beasts of the earth. None of what we're seeing in this chapter, in this section, falls outside of the, the authority that was given to the Lamb. God is still in control. And similar to what we see, or we hear Joseph say at the end of um, Genesis, in chapter 50, we hear him say, What you intended for evil, God intended for good, the saving of many lives. Now, We'll see a whole lot of evil happening here, but it's not happening outside of the control of the Lamb. The Lamb is in control, using what people intend for evil to achieve His purposes. We'll see it's His purposes of saving many and His purposes of um, punishing or judging the wicked. So... The lamb, again, is a key character here. We also see, again, the four living creatures who we met in the previous section. We saw last time that these um, four living creatures represent all of creation. Um, all of creation is calling out here, um, preparing creation for what's about to be seen. We see these four horses, so a white horse, a fiery red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse. Now, there is lots of debate around um, who these horses represent. Um, there is some discussion about whether this white horse is the same as the white horse that we see later in Revelation, um, the Lord Jesus himself. Now, as I read this, I, I struggle to, to see how this white horse can represent Christ. I think this represents more an antichrist. And in this case, um, I take it that this white horse represents um, a tyrannical ruler, a tyrant. And the horses that follow are the results of tyrannical rule. So let me highlight here what we see. This is a, a conqueror bent on conquest. And that's conquest in a negative sense. Um, and what follows this tyrant ruler is he, he has the power to take peace from earth and to make people kill each other. So... This is strife and warfare. So tyrant ruler is followed by strife and warfare. And 
what follows on the heels of that is this black rider and a pair of scales in the Old Testament, an ancient world, a pair of scales stood for a time of famine where food was rationed, needed to be weighed out. And this voice heard from among the living creatures calling calling out makes it clear that this is um, talking about a famine, um, starvation, because two pounds of wheat for a day's wages is a mere handful of wheat. It's not enough to feed your family and there definitely won't be enough for luxuries like oil and wine. So this is representing a time of famine. And then this tyrant ruler who, or tyrannical rule that is followed by strife and warfare and famine is naturally, sadly, followed by death. So, death and the place of the dead, Hades, follows. In verse 8b, um, the they... He's speaking of all of these four horses. So this is a summary statement. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. This is showing that um, although we know all people die, these horses make it clear that a big number of people will die too early by unnatural causes, by war and strife and famine. Um, by wild beasts of the earth, by plague. So, these four evil horsemen that we meet up front um, show us the destiny, the destiny of disaster and death and persecution that will come. Interestingly, this word for kill each other here and kill by the sword, they're actually two different words. Um, the word for kill here is the same as the word slain here, and the word killed here is the same word here. Linking back to, this is the cry of the martyrs, which you're going to look at right now, the, the death that we see, these four, first four Riders is, is death to all people on earth, but it's got a particular focus on those who die because they're following Jesus. And we see in the second section that we, we're going to look at this, the death of the martyrs or the cry of the martyrs. These are the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. They call out, how long, Sovereign Lord? And they're each given a white robe, which signifies that they are the victorious ones. They've made it to the end, still trusting Jesus. But they're told that more of their brothers and sisters are going to be killed, just as they had been. We meet these same people in chapter 7. Those who were sealed, they are called here. And they are the servants of God. They are the 144,000, which is the same as this great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Again, we see them wearing white robes. We see the link there. And it's made explicit at the end of chapter 7 these are they who came through the great tribulation and have washed their robes, made them white again in the blood of the Lamb. So the white robes linked with the blood of the Lamb. These are Christians. So the first four seals paint the picture of the destiny of our world. It's going to be characterized by tyrannical rule and war and strife and famine and ultimately death. Death by unnatural causes. That Death will affect God's people too. So the, cry, the martyrs are crying out, How long? Lord, when are you going to judge? They're told to wait a little bit longer. But then the picture here jumps ahead and we are actually given a picture of that 
day when um, the sixth seal being opened is a picture of the day of judgment when the wrath of the lamb is shown. Don't often think of lambs as wrathful, but the kings of the earth and the princes and the generals, everybody is absolutely terrified at the wrath of the lamb. We see here um, creation itself is becoming undone. Uh, there's earthquakes and the sun and the moon are changing color and stars are falling from the sky and mountains and and islands are being moved from their normal place. It's a terrifying picture. This is um, similar to the description that we, we read, for example, in Matthew um, 24 or Mark 13. This is the end of history as we know it. The world is coming to an end as the sixth seal is opened. And we saw in the previous section, chapters 4 and 5, that the throne is a key theme in the rest of Revelation. And here we see um, from chapter 7, um, the throne is a key theme in this section again, all the way through into the beginning of chapter 8. In this section, it's the one on the throne who is terrifying those who are who stand opposed to him. The, the lamb who is slain to purchase people for God is also a lamb who will return in wrath. Wrath against those who stand against him. On that day, they won't be able to stand. They won't be able to withstand him. We've got a big transition that happens here in chapter 7 though before the seventh seal is opened um, we we are told after this the strange thing about revelation is that although john saw this after what he had just seen here these events clearly happen before the lamb rides um, because we're about to see that god's people are absolutely safe and secure from the judgment that we see in um, as the sixth seal is opened. And before the seventh seal is opened, where the actual judgment takes place, we see that God's people are sealed. They are um, absolutely safe. Verse 3 here just helps us to see what's going on in chapter um, seven. So he says, do not harm the land or the seas or the trees. Um, so we've seen these four um, winds that are being held back by four angels. These four winds and the four um, horses of the apocalypse are the same thing. They are the destructive forces at work in our world. And we're told in verse three, don't harm the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. So we're looking forward to these uh, sealed people. And to have, to, for a deal to be signed and sealed means that it's done. So to be a part of the sealed people of God mean, means that the deal is done, the salvation has been paid, you're absolutely secure. And then we're told that it's 144,000, um, just important in Revelation. We need to do a little bit of maths from time to time. But we've got the, the 12 Old Testament um, tribes of Israel. We've got the 12 New Testament apostles, um, the Old Testament people of God, the New Testament people of God. 12 times 12 equals 144. And a thousand in the Bible is a term for a very large number. So 144 times a thousand 144,000. It's a picture of all of God's people from the Old Testament, New Testament, um, times a thousand, a very big number. It is all of God's people, um, this whole picture that we're given here. And we know that that's the truth because what John hears, he hears 144,000, and what he sees don't match up. He hears that, but look what he sees a great multitude that no one could count. This is a humongous number 
standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Um, again, they're dressed in white robes. These are the victorious ones, the saints. And they are praising God because salvation has come from him. They've been saved by their God. And so they are worshipping him. We saw a lot of worship in chapters 4 and 5. And here again, they are worshipping God. Then in case John isn't sure who these um, in the white robes are, the elder tells him, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. Now, that's a very important uh, point just to discuss. There are lots of opinions on what the great tribulation is. Um, I'm convinced that the great tribulation is the time we're living in now. The time between Jesus' first and second coming. So, these are the days we're living in right now. We're living through the Great Tribulation. It is hard to be a Christian right now. Um, but the great news is, one day those who come through these days, who keep trusting Jesus, who have had their robes made white in the blood of the Lamb, they will be before the throne of God forever. Um, the one on the throne will shelter them. He will protect them. They won't hunger and thirst. This, the famine and the hardship will be over. And the sun won't beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. And the lamb himself, this victorious one, this powerful lamb on the throne, will be their shepherd, looking after them, taking them to springs of living water, which we'll see at the end of Revelation, a beautiful picture of the living water flowing from the throne. And we'll also see at the end in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation, that God will wipe every tear from their eyes. But much bigger than just seeing this picture at the end of Revelation, all of what we see here are pointing back to the Old Testament. To understand Revelation well, we need a big, full understanding of the Old Testament that will help us to, to really grasp um, what is happening in this, this book. And this interlude that we get in the whole of chapter 7 all of chapter 7 is an interlude between uh, the 6th and 7th seals. We really need this. As God's people, we need to know that, yes, there will be suffering now, but eternity is coming, and in eternity we will be absolutely safe because we have been sealed. God will protect us. He'll wipe the tears from our eyes. The Lamb will be shepherding us. It is a glorious reality that we look forward to. John needed that, we need that, before the seventh seal is opened because we're about to see silence in heaven for half an hour. Now, silence for half an hour, just imagine half an hour of silence in heaven where all creation has been rejoicing in chapters 4 and 5. All of a sudden, everything is absolutely silent. We need to know that this is an Old Testament picture for divine judgment. So divine judgment is taking place. Um, the, we see the Lamb returning to judge as the sixth seal is opened. Now as the seventh seal is opened, the actual judgment takes place. And it is terrifying. There's silence in heaven because no one can speak. No one can respond to the judgment that is seen to be taking place here. Um, in verse 5 here, we see the actual judgment. Then the angel took a censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there were, were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. It's meant to be a picture of the climactic end of the cosmos as the Lamb judges. There's a little transition here in verse 2. Um, we see these seven angels and they're given seven trumpets. We, we're going to see in the next section those seven trumpets being blown. But as this section is wrapped up, we see all history playing out and the ultimate judgment um, being finalized. But between that, we have to hold on to chapter 7. 
Those who have been sealed are absolutely secure. So we have this reality. We know that suffering's coming. But as God sealed people, we can suffer well knowing that eternity is coming, which will be incomparably glorious compared with the suffering that we face now. So as you dig into this further, as you teach it to others, um, I pray that God would uh, stir your heart to remind you of ultimate reality, that he'd help you to face the suffering of this life, and that you would also be able to help others who are going through times of suffering to, to suffer well as we wait for this day when God brings us home and he wipes away the tears from our eyes. Well, God bless as you dig in further.